June 1st, are we already almost halfway through the year? This is crazy. All right. anyone's convenience who might not already have it, there's the link for the community notes in Zoom chat. Please feel free to go ahead and add yourself to attendees. And while everyone logs in and fills that out, if anyone wants to introduce themselves, um, I know we have Alexander new on the call with us today. Hey everyone, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, I can hear you well. Awesome. Yeah, so my name's Alex. I'm a consultant with Red Hat based in Canberra, Australia. Um, yeah, I've been moving, I guess, more into the OpenShift and uh, like, yeah, Kubernetes and virtualization side of the house. So thought I'd pop in and say hello. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Hi, Alex, not to put you on the spot. Were you the one that had proposed the GDB uh, sidecar? All right. That I'll is me. On it. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Awesome. All right. It looks like we're still filling out some items on the agenda. Dan. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you want to go ahead and uh, speak to the PR item that you have on the agenda? Guess we're all a little bit slow this morning, or I'm maybe running unusually quick. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm not sure why Zoom messed with my audio settings, but yeah. Okay, it's a bit quiet. But we'll do our best to hear you. Uh, I'm I'm trying to increase the that's uh, audio volume. That's better. Yeah, that's okay, good. Great. Okay, I was just uh, wanting to say that uh, we had something strange going on. If uh, Catherine, if you if you would want to click at the link that I inserted, the proud <laughs> job load dashboard. Um, what you see there should be hopefully visible soon. Yeah, that's exactly the thing. Uh, the spike you see there is uh, the sudden impact that um, a lot of uh, cute PRs um, have on our CI infrastructure. So uh, what you see there, for example, is that there are lots of uh, projects in the queue. Uh, this, the, just to explain a little bit on this. Um, what happened was that there were around 10 PRs that weren't okay to test, which suddenly became okay to test. And as we have around 40 jobs uh, per PR running, we had around 400 um, jobs that would be running suddenly. Um, and this uh, explains the spike. So um, just so that everyone knows that if someone is suddenly getting accepted into the community, which I, I told, just to be clear on this, I really love people getting accepted into the community, but probably we might look at uh, how their PR state is. And maybe um, if they have lots of open PRs, uh, we, should, we should be a little bit more careful next time probably. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to overload the CI. Yeah, 
actually. I think, uh, oh, so, so to, uh, the good thing is that it coped pretty okay. It uh, got um, into a normal state or a couple of hours later, but yeah, just, just please be aware that if you are putting someone, adding someone to the community and he has open PRs that are not yet okay to test, this might flood the CI system with PRs or with, with broad jobs. Sounds good. Thank you for bringing that up. So, so Daniel, can you please explain? I I'm, I'm don't understand what can be done. So I, it's like, I mean, we, what we will tell them, or, I mean, one option is to tell them you cannot get in until, <laughs> this is like, a, I don't understand what's the solution. Yeah, there were, um, there were, 10 PRs open. So uh, the, uh, the thing was that the member that just got accepted had 10 PRs open that weren't okay to test. Um, to be honest, I, I could probably um, think of a couple of things, probably that we might not accept the person um, if it has so many PRs open that aren't okay to test, then maybe at first clear out the situation, somehow look at the PRs and uh, pose an okay to test one by one. I think that, for example, um, the PRs in question were uh, refactoring PRs. There is nothing wrong with refactoring PRs, to be clear on that. I, I just, um, I think that cleaning up the code is a good thing. But the thing is, if you are doing lots of uh, com lots of commits and separate PRs, you increase the load. And I think what would be have been a better thing probably would be to have a lot of commits in one PR. So we would not have this situation. Um, yeah, um, I don't want to go into more detail um, into that because I think the, the point is clear that I'm trying to make. Um, and of, I'm just wanting to raise awareness that you probably should sometimes look at, um, okay, how many PRs are open by this, this, this community member that, or oh, that is about to get community member. Um, and maybe have a look if you are accepting uh, or you should sort out those issues beforehand. We didn't get in a bad situation because we didn't have that much of a load on your CI, but we could have been, right? Sorry, Daniel, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. So I think the issue was, <clears throat> it wasn't adding the community member to the organization. It's just that the PRs were manually marked okay to test. So 10 of them ah. were marked okay to test at once. So that was, so the, the the member was only added this morning, but the issue happened yesterday. So mm -hmm. it was actually okay. just uh yeah, so just a lot of PRs were marked okay to test at once and it was just so okay, then, then it's even worse. I I'd say probably that the people or the, the folks that um, added the okay to test should probably have had a look at the PRs and suggested probably that they should be one PR. Because I think if you are moving a function around, this is not really a thing that should have its own PR. If you are moving several functions around, that, that still is a good thing. But this could be also one PR where you're doing this all in a single in, in, in a set of commits, right? And then you would just have one PR, and then all would have been good. So, so just to kind of oh, go, for, go, go for it. Well, I was just thinking, um, I mean, we're not expecting to see this exact scenario extremely frequently. So I imagine if we watch for it in any future um, like community joining approvals, we it should be fairly reasonable to, to manage, right? I don't think we have to get too far into the weeds with it. Yeah, actually, that, that's the thing that I'm trying to point out. Sorry for not being clear enough. Um, what I was trying to say is that if you are issuing an OK to test on several PRs um, from the same person, probably, or from uh, that, then there might be something wrong. So just that's all I'm, I'm trying to say. The, maybe maybe the, the structure is not, not 
that good. Uh, am I am I clear enough or? I think it came through clearly. Does anyone else have anything else to say about it? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this actually happens quite frequently. Uh, if it's a member that submits the PR, it, they don't even need OK to test. So uh, whenever someone is doing code cleaning and creating uh, 10 PRs for it instead of one, uh, we get into that scenario. So uh, I think this is something we should try to avoid. And whenever we do code cleaning, try to do it in, in, in uh, as few PRs as possible. So I, I'm like, <laughs> I, I like, like I understand the problem, but you are asking me to understand that there is a CI infrastructure behind it that I need to, to, to take into account on how I work, like in a regular way. Like if I'm doing 10 refactoring and they are not dependent one on each other at all, and I prefer to send 10 PRs because then uh, if, if each one can be independent and can get merged quicker, if I, if I send 10 commits on a single PR on 10 different things, even if it's the same refactoring, then I, ha I have a, there is good chance that I will wait like every single thing, uh, like 20, 30, 40 comments there will be on this PR. So there is an advantage of a small PR. Now, there is, I understand the problem, but I'm not sure if it's like there is a solution for this, like a simple solution. I, I would, I would a complete odds to that, Edward. I would say that uh, we're not unique as a open source project. It would, I think the assumption would automatically be that there is a CI system for any open source project that you're committing to. And so I would always be cognizant of the load that was being, uh, impacted on the CI system. Yes, I agree. But what, what I'm trying to say is that I don't think we can control it. Like in the in the sense of please don't do it or or, or the, you want to put on the maintainer or someone that approves it this understanding that he needs to care about this. I mean he's supposed to care about being effective in taking in stuff. This is what I'm trying to, but it, I mean, it will cost you either way. Either it will cost you that the PR will not get in for a long time because there is a review process or there is, it will cost you because the CI will be overloaded. I don't know what is uh, better or worse here actually. But well, yeah. I don't think we have to, <laughs> we're getting pretty far in the weeds on this. Let's just try to make less PRs if we can. Just when we're making judgment calls about uh, refactoring or whatever we're doing, favor less PRs. I think we can just leave it at that for now. Exactly. That, that's my point. And besides that, I, don't get me wrong on this. I have nothing against cleaning up the code base, which is a great thing to do. But in general, I understand refactoring as something that you do while you're trying to implement a feature. And refactoring on its own, I think, doesn't have as much value. All right, cool. And yeah, if if there, if the the outcome would be that the few PRs would be something that would be okay, I I go with that. Awesome. Okay. Um, all right. In that case, um, do we want to go ahead and jump into the GDB port discussion? Sure thing. So, yeah, I guess at the moment um, with a client or a customer, um, and we're, well, they're, one of their use cases for virtualization is uh, kernel module development. Um, and as part of this, well, traditionally they were using just like KVM on top of RHEL or, or whatnot or whatever. Um, and so they were able to implement like or expose the GDP uh, like port quite easily. Whereas now they're making the shift 
over to like Hoover and Overture Fertilization. Um, and it's not something that they can just natively do. So as an intermediary a solution, we're looking at using a sidecar. Uh, so we're based, we're based the, the current iteration off of the uh, example hook sidecar. And we'll just modify that to um, modify the domain XML with, and expose uh, the, the GDB stuff. Um, so I guess going forward, what we're hoping to, to help implement is uh, something that's more native that doesn't require the use of a sidecar. So whether it be exposing um, the port via annotations on, on the VM that you want to have that functionality or, or whatnot is, I guess, part of that discussion that I'm, I'm wanting to have. So I guess what I'm trying to get out of this at the moment is, um, yeah, I've kind of submitted a few things around. So you might've seen in, in the mailing list, um, a couple of things for myself. But yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to work out what's the next best, like what's the next steps to, to get this kind of moving. Um, and then I'll, yeah, I want to be able to put some resources behind that from our end as well. Alex, um, is, um, is this uh, GDB can be enabled uh, uh, dynamically through a monitor command and, um, and not statically via uh, this command line in Cameo? So, Usually how it's been used is either, yeah, um, just by using that TechS switch with uh, Kermu or in KVM and the domain XML, adding those um, Kermu command line arguments where you can specify tag GDB and then the port as well. Um, but like our... Ideally, it would be something that we could, I guess, turn off and on dynamically um, rather than at the definition of the VM at the very start. Um, yeah, be able to, I guess, turn it on um, if the VM's already been deployed would be fantastic. Sorry, uh, so in general, Libert supports uh, um, like sending uh, QMU monitor commands to running VMs is just a matter of um, of exposing this uh, in 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 Kubert. I guess it could be something like a sub resource or um, something in that nature. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That sounds that sounds pretty reasonable to me. So I guess um, yeah, like I don't have a huge amount of exposure to I guess the underlying Kubert. Uh, like, yeah, foundation. So I guess how that sub resource would be defined is something that I would need to look into as well. Well, I, I would think about, uh, well, I, I'm not sure, but I, 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 we have a, a Vert CTL um, a console uh, implementation that basically connects, uh, streams everything from um, the console socket. Um, we could do something similar to uh, to this with the virtual debug or, or something like that, or or as a sub resource. Um, but then it would dynamically send the uh, um, a monitor command, um, and then that would uh, that would be streamed out uh, through um, through a certain socket. Alex, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah so it. with your um, issue that I'm looking at now, with the sidecar, how are you getting the, how, how are you connecting to the GDB uh, port GCP. now? Or GDB? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're still, still working through it because um, at the moment, it seems that the sidecar feature gate in OpenShift is disabled by default for, for Cuba. Um, so that's the, the hurdle we're currently working through at the moment. So we believe, I mean, I built the image and it's passed all the build tests. 
So I guess it's at least syntactically correct. Um, but yeah, we haven't actually been able to deploy the sidecar in like an OpenShift uh, environment yet to, I guess, to actually make sure it functions as expected. So when you um, do and the libvert is um, modified, I don't know how to connect to that. I think you'd have to like do a, a kubectl exec into that pod, the vert launcher pod and connect there. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so we will probably create a service um, and expose that service in order to be able to use, I guess, GDP on like our, our physical workstation and connect to that port. I don't know if it'll work. It depends on how the network yeah. is set up. So we, we hand off the network interface to, maybe that works with Masquerade, I'm not sure. We hand off the network interface that's given to the pod to the QMU uh, guest. So I don't know yeah. if you can connect. For sure. Pod. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's something that we'll need to investigate as well. Okay, what would it be like, I'm, I'm trying to determine like how user-friendly does this need to be for you all? Is it as simple as you just need to enable uh, this QMU arg value uh, on the um, libvert domain XML and then you'd be comfortable with like cube exec, cube CTL exec into the pod and then doing stuff or do you need it to be like super user-friendly where there's just like a <laughs> command line tool that connects to it directly? No, it, it definitely doesn't need to be that that user friendly. So, I mean, the people that are using this, uh, like, yeah, do kernel development and whatnot, um, and a lot of them do a lot of other open shifty or or Kubernetes related um, development as well. So, it, it doesn't need to be super super user friendly. Um, yeah. Okay. This can work even today. I mean, the only thing you need to do is just to exec into the vert launcher pod and then. Uh, do virs um, kmu monitor command gdb and then you'll get it into the gdb environment okay i'll definitely have to give that a go so uh, you, you can also connect to from the outside to to vert launcher like i've been using a uh, pprof to debug vert launcher and, and i was able to connect from the host to the compute container running uh kmu and vert launcher um, I'm not quite sure why you need a, a, a sidecar for all that, but I'm probably missing a part. This, this is for QMU GDB, right? To debug uh, QMU uh, or to debug the kernel that's run inside QMU. Yeah, QMU yeah. is running in the same container as uh, Broad Launcher, right? Yeah, it just, the, he needs to get into the kernel that's inside the virtual machine with GDB. Which is provided by QMU. Yeah, absolutely. So then QMU monitor command GDB gets you there. OK. Yeah, so and the only reason that we went down the sidecar route, I guess, is we didn't have a, like, a solid understanding of how the VERT launcher fully interacted and what capabilities we were able to use out of the box. So we just went for what we thought was the simplest method, which is just modifying the domain XML um, using a hook. All right, so it sounds like we have a general direction at least to investigate. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That was a neat conversation. Be fun to see how that develops for you guys. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for everyone's input. I really appreciate it. Um, just out of idle curiosity, as the um, customer that you're working with, um, potentially valid for adding to the Kubert adopters list? So I'm talking to them at the moment. Um, I'm really hoping that they are. Um, okay. Yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm in discussions with them at the moment. That's great, just so long as it's kind of on the radar. Definitely. All right. And then it looks like, Edward, you have some EDE -E test conversation. Uh, I just had the, I have a question. I don't know if someone here can, can answer it. I will try. 
So we, in the end, end to end test, we are, have uh, some waiting uh, functionality that, for example, we are waiting for the VMI to be ready or running. And as part of this waiting, in some cases, not all of them, but in some cases, there is uh, a watch is created there inside that watches for event objects. It's like, the, I mean, I'm talking about the event object, not the, not the event uh, command. So, um, so, sorry, not the events that the watcher receives, but uh, the events object. I hope I'm clear. It's, like, it's confusing me usually. So can someone please help me understand uh, what, is, what is the reason behind it? I mean, I understand that in some cases, uh, we wanted to check that there is no error in the middle of processing some VMI or something like that. Is this correct or? Yeah, it's just, uh, so there's transient reconcile errors that can occur and an event would um, be fired that, that occurred. We'd want to know about that. I can't okay, so recall concrete examples, but I know at some point in the past, I found that the only way to find evidence that an action had been taken was from the event logs. Uh, and so that would be a reason to lean on it. But, it. but yeah, in general, I don't know that I would do it. Because of the eventual oh. consistency nature of all our reconcile loops, those types of errors get covered up. So uh, let's say a reconcile error uh, occurs and it causes, that's gonna cause a lot more um, work on behalf of the reconciler. Now, if we were just, doing a time-based, like waiting for a VMI, for example, to reach a running state uh, within 30 seconds, that might get covered up. That error might get covered up because it was transient. If we look at the event log, we can determine that something unexpected did occur that's new, uh, and we can go back and investigate that. That's kind of our only evidence right now. There's some other ways we can look at that, but um, that's kind of the way it's been done historically in Qvert. So so, so, but but you want to understand this in the middle of the test. So you want to fail the test if this is happening. This is what you're saying, because in in the sense of collecting the information, the information I think it's collected anyway, in the end. But you want it. You want to have an action on it in the middle. This is this is what I understand. If an unexpected warning or error occurs, uh, then yes. That would be something that we would want to fail because it need to be investigated. It's something different. It's a, it's a new state that occurred during that test that didn't occur previously. But isn't is like, but let's say that it happened. You have a transient error, and then the next re, re, and the next reconcile it succeeds. So why is that a problem? Because at the at the moment the end to end test we have like parallel access to the API server and some load in some cases. So I guess it can happen all the time that we'll have transient errors like this. So I'm trying to understand why, uh, if this is like intentional or, or can, we, can we say that uh, I mean, it's not acceptable that it will do a one reconcile? This is what I'm trying to understand. It, it's one of those things we want to understand. So if, okay. a, if an error occurs and it's well understood why it occurs and it's necessary as part of the test, then that's why we have like a, an ignore filter at times where you can say, wait for this condition, ignore this specific error uh, in the event log. Um, it's for those kinds of exceptions. Yeah, so there, there's okay. times when, yeah, you're right will understand why something occurs and will want to consider it part of the test to ignore it. Okay. Is there, is there any other reason to have it or that, that's it? Uh, primarily it's to catch unexpected reconcile events. So okay. just to, By the way, I, it caused like all these things add up just to give a little bit more context So we have, for example, a new um, error condition in our VMI start flow that we weren't aware of, then that causes possibly 20% more reconciles when every VMI starts, which then when you start 1,000 VMIs, that's 20% more API load and things like that. So 
that's why we want to be aware of these things. Okay. Okay. So, and and my last question regarding this: if we if we had watched the the object itself, let's say we watched the VMI itself, the events from the VMI, not the event object, the just watching the VMI, wouldn't we each reconcile get some update about something happening, or we are not updating the status every all the time? Like if there was an error, for example. Okay. We're not guaranteed I mean, that the status will update because of an error. Okay. I mean, it, well, for example, this is the, the error could be that status couldn't update. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I think that might not be possible. I have to go back and look at how the, the reconcile loop is handled and how errors um, propagate from the event. Um, sorry, from the update status function. but. Things like that can occur. So you wouldn't always see it if you're watching the object. And I'm also not sure that we're guaranteed that uh, we see every update. Like we, we get the latest update, but I don't know if they're ever like munged together or anything uh, if they happen really quickly. I, I'm kind of making this up as I go, but I'm not sure we're guaranteed to see it. Like an info. Uh, it's, it, yeah. yeah, it's like the watch. The watcher would. You could make it's. Like, it's like the informer. You could make the watcher. The watcher is actually guaranteeing you that you get all the events from a specific time. But you need to. It's I guess more or less like an informer, but without a catch. A catch if you handle it correctly. But but uh, but if we cannot, if we cannot uh, trust that uh, you get an event when there is an error, like uh, then, yeah, that would not help. Okay, thank you. I think I summarized that correctly. Um, and then Andrew Burden, it looks like, you wanted to help us clean up our calendar invite crazies. That sounds yeah. fantastic. I vote yes. <laughs> so this is just a, um, a four week warning, I guess, so that no one gets any surprises in case they have a particular preference for one of the three, I think, entries into our calendar. <laughs> um, also, while we're here, I know there's one created by Qbert at CNCF io which is the should be the official one i know there's one created by fabian deutsch i think there's a third one but i delete it from my personal calendar can someone help me out and tell me who the owner of that third calendar invite is i guess that this might have been the previous community manager chris caligari could be at least oh, okay excellent all right. Negative. Oh. You also need to search out Adam Licky. Adam Licky has an, entry. A, an original. I believe there is one on a different calendar as well. Okay, excellent. All right. So I will contact Fabian and Adam to delete those. So uh, over the next uh, four weeks, I'll, I'll give a, a, a T minus warning. And then at the end of June, I'll, I'll have those removed. And we should just have the one. And um, it, it seems superfluous, but it does mean at the end of daylight savings, we'll, we won't have that confusion because the different calendar invites are set to different times. Um, I also haven't put it in the agenda. So uh, sorry about this, but uh, I'll also use this as an opportunity to remind people that there is the KVM forum and the KubeCon US call for proposal submission dates coming up Friday. Um, if anyone's still kind of like thinking about stuff or isn't sure about how to uh, uh, commence with submitting those things, please hit me up. Um, happy to talk through things and I've learned a little bit about, you know, the different uh, submission uh, requirements for those two conferences. So, so please ping me or send me an email. Um, or if you want to raise it here, then by all means. But that's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we don't have anything specifically on the open floor. Going on to going twice, anyone else have anything to speak up about or add to PRs, bug scrubs, or specific mailing list items? Please add those. And as it is, 
excuse me. I will go ahead and pull up PRs for review. Looks like we have a few minutes left. Okay, and I swear this is the last week I will promise to submit to open the issue to join the community. I know, Andrew, you said that you will help me with that, so thank you. Let's see. This is for parallelizing the CI, which I guess might increase the load on our pipeline, which we just had a conversation about. I didn't look too close at the PR, but I think that the intent is quite the opposite. I guess that they are trying to Paralyze, uh, parallelize the test somehow. And um, I think that is a good thing because in overall, if tests are running in parallel, they should uh, lead to a shorter execution time of the overall lane. But yeah, this is just my guessing. So maybe, uh, I, I guess that I'm just looking at, uh, I'll just look at this PR and probably clear this up. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Interesting. The has root viewers assigned. Man, this morning has already been a busy morning. Viewers on that one. That is definitely not stuck. Okay, and that gets us back past last week. Take a look at the mailing list. And then that is Alex's and that covered. So I think we're good on mailing list. Fun script time. Let's see what we got.
Interesting. I have not experienced that one myself. Does anyone else have experience with this possible scenario? Uh, it looks like um, an asynchronous network performance observation. Eddie, would you know anything? Yes, I can hear you. I would, I would have to. Can you please assign a CC me or something and I will look for it? Okay. okay. Um, wait, hang on. Uh, who is that speaking? I don't have your voice memorized. It's Eddie Dev. I did not get that. I'm sorry. I will, I will write it down. E D. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that one. That one. Sweet. And then that gets us past last week's web review. So in that case, I think we're good, unless anyone has any last minute things they wanna bring attention to. And in that case, thank you all for all of the participation this morning. I'm sorry, it's not morning for everybody. I actually do know this. Anyway, um, have a great week and I will see you same time, same place next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Bye, see you next Bye. week.